And the question that we're going to tackle today is very familiar. Why do different assets earn different average returns? Theoretically, the answer is clear. It should be exposed differentially to undiversifiable risks. But when we take our measures of those undiversifiable risks to the data, we find a lot of anomalies, a lot of ways to differentiate assets that lead to differences in average returns that aren't associated with the risks we can measure. Now, when we measure this, we have in mind a linear, a conditional linear factor model of that form, where the excess return at time t plus one is related possibly to an alpha, something you knew at time t, plus a beta, some exposure you also knew at time t, times a realization of the systematic risk in the system. And as a pricing theory, tests really want to ask, is alpha zero for all the assets in all time periods? And there are two broad ways that we'll say the literature has taken to test this theory. The first is to use what we'll call observable factors. So let's sort stocks based on some observable characteristic, some observable characteristic that's been associated with average returns. So think SMB, HML, momentum, something like that. That's one approach. The other is a purely statistical factor and analytic approach. Okay, ever since uh, Chamberlain and Rothschild's 83 Econometrica, we know that the APT says that these aggregate risk factors should be the factors that are responsible for most of the common variation in these stock returns. Let's estimate it that way. Now, when these techniques are taken to the data, an identif identifying assumption is that the loadings, the relationship of the stock returns to the aggregate risk factors is static over time. But we don't really believe that because in that observable factor approach, we allow stocks to transition between the long and the short end of these portfolios because stocks evolve over time in the characteristics with respect to the characteristics we see. So we combine this into a new procedure called instrument and principal components analysis, trying to combine those two approaches. It is a latent factor model estimator that allows for time varying loadings. The time variation in these loadings are going to come from the data, the observable characteristics. This is going to allow us to ask and answer an interesting generalization of that important gibbons ross Schenken test question. Are all the alpha zero? That question has been asked with respect to particular measurements of aggregate risk. We will ask that question with respect to some set that we estimate at the same time of common risk factors. Do some common risk factors explain this anomaly, that anomaly, all the anomalies? What we find in the data is that once we allow for two or four, two to four factors, we find no evidence that characteristics are generating alpha. What we find is evidence that the characteristics tell us robust information about expected returns. And it's coming via what they tell us about risk exposures how they differ across assets, and how they differ over time. Nonetheless, we'll consider a large set of characteristic information, and we'll ask, do we need that entire set? And we'll find no. We'll find that many of the characteristics that we analyze are statistically irrelevant, do not provide significant new information relative to the other characteristics. So to make these claims, here's the model I have in mind. The first is that factor model where R is the excess return. All we do is we add one equation to this model. It's an equation for the loadings, the betas. Beta T minus one now equals Z T minus one times gamma. Z T minus one is this matrix of observable asset characteristics. They are mapped to the risk exposures by this gamma parameter which is constant across assets and constant over time. So we're tying ourselves to an explanation of risk exposure that is coming from observable data. And the reason why we're doing this is we want the model to have a chance to explain the relationship that previous literature has found between expected returns and characteristics via a risk-based factor model. So if the information in characteristics lines up with expected returns exactly in the way that those uh, risk exposures to aggregate risks look, then this more general model is going to ascribe the impact of the characteristics, 
to beta. It's going to estimate non-zero elements in what I'm calling gamma beta, that matrix. However, if the characteristic tells me something about future returns that is not associated with exposure to the, the sources of aggregate risk, then this more general model will ascribe the impact of the characteristics to an alpha, to an intercept. And those elements of the parameter vector gamma alpha will be non-zero. And that's going to form a hypothesis test will run. Is that gamma alpha parameter vector zero or not? So we take those two equations, we drop them into a least squares objective function. I'm not gonna talk about that right now. I'm gonna give you an idea of what this estimator looks like. The solution to the objective function kind of looks like this. For each characteristic, run a, a cross-sectional regression at each point in time of the returns in the cross-section on the lag characteristics. What you've just calculated is a return on a characteristic managed portfolio. Do that for all the characteristics. Call that XLT. Every time period, every characteristic, put that together into a panel. This X, these are the returns on characteristic managed portfolios. Pull out the first K principal components of X. You can see, hopefully, the similarity and the difference vis-a-vis -vis principal components. Principal components is going to pull out the factors that are responsible for the common variation in returns. IPCA is going to pull out the factors responsible for the common variation in the characteristic managed portfolios. The key parameter here is gamma. It provides a tight link between the factors we estimate to the portfolios we form to estimate those factors to the individual asset level. All of these are tied together. Therefore, to estimate this model, I do not need to take a stand and what are the proper test assets or the portfolios I should bring to estimation? I bring to the estimation, we bring to the estimation, just individual stock level data. So the two hypothesis tests I'm gonna talk about in this presentation, the first is about anomalies. I'm going to ask, is gamma alpha equal to zero? If it's not equal to zero, then there's some information realized before returns are realized that tell me about those future returns and are not associated with risk exposure. That is what we'll call an anomaly. But if I can accept the hypothesis that gamma alpha is zero, then these characteristics don't tell me anything about future returns that is not risk exposure information. So that's gonna be our first hypothesis test. The second one, once I think that these characteristics are telling me about risk exposure, we thought a natural question to ask is, do you need the entire zoo of characteristics that we bring to the table? So that question is going to boil down to a question about one of the rows in this gamma beta matrix. Because if the jth characteristic tells me nothing about risk exposure, that's gonna be translated into the jth row of gamma beta being zero. Because those characteristics move cross-sectionally over time, but they don't tell me anything about the beta on the aggregate risk factors. And so that'll be the other hypothesis test that I present results for. The empirical findings that I'm gonna talk about use monthly data from 1962 to 2014 on about 12,000 stocks. We focus on 36 characteristics that are very familiar, size, book to market, momentum of individual stocks, profitability. In the paper, we analyze the different nature of the information coming from the characteristics, the un what we call the unconditional, coming from the time series average of a certain firm's characteristic and the conditional coming from the deviation. I'm not really gonna talk about that here, but in essence, at the end, we're gonna have 73 what we call instruments um, to describe beta. So the three statistics I'm gonna report. Um, the first we've already talked about, actually, let, let me talk about the third. The third are the p-values of this gamma alpha test. Can I accept the hypothesis that characteristics do not give me anomalous information, information about future returns that's untied to risk compensation. The other two things that we think that a risk model should give is one, a description of the aggregate risks in the economy, 
and two, a description of the compensation for those risks. So to measure that, I will first turn to the total R squared. That's the proportion of the variation in individual stock returns that is coming from the aggregate risks we're estimating. That's an important statistic. But even more important to the asset price in question is understanding the risk compensation these stocks receive for being loaded on that risk. And that we're going to measure by the predictive R squared. We're going to measure what is the proportion of variation in realized returns that's coming from the model implied conditional expectations. In the general model, if there's an alpha, that's part of your conditional expectation. There's a beta, you knew that ahead of time, your exposure to risk, times a lambda, which is just going to be the risk premia associated with those aggregate risk factors we're estimating right there. So here are the benchmark results. What this is saying is that once we allow for three, four, five factors, aggregate risks, as we measure them, account for about 20% of the variation in individual monthly stock returns. What we also uncover is that the conditional expectations, the compensation for bearing this aggregate risk, explain about 2% of the variation and individual monthly stock returns. You will notice that the model imposing the gamma alpha zero or allowing it to be non-zero achieve essentially the same risk description. That's going to go hand in hand with this idea that as soon as we estimate a multi-dimensional aggregate risk space, that is once we allow for two or more factors, we can accept the hypothesis that there are no alphas. We can accept the hypothesis the characteristics matter, but only with respect to what they're telling us about risk exposures. Now, are these results good? I don't know. Let's compare them to alternatives. The alternatives I'm going to have in mind are principal components or observable factor models. I'm going to use the Fama French 5. I'm going to add momentum. How do they do? We know that the Fama French 5 model gives us low, small alphas. So are these numbers good? And furthermore, did I introduce a lot of parameters? Like, was I hiding something about how many parameters I'm estimating here to get that good performance if it is good? It is good. Let's look at the comparison. When I compare what IPCA, our model, is telling us about aggregate risks to what Fama French Carhartt models tell us, they agree in terms of how much aggregate risk there is in these stock returns. About 20% of the variation in individual monthly stock returns is coming from aggregate risks. These observable factor models have needed to estimate almost 20 times more parameters to get there. Why? Because if you have 11,452 stocks and you estimate the cap M, you need to estimate 11,452 parameters. And if you estimate the Carhartt model, you need to estimate 45,808 parameters, one for every stock. We don't have that. We don't have asset-specific loadings. We just have that mapping matrix, that gamma matrix, between characteristics that are data and the risk exposures that we're using. Nonetheless, even though we estimate about 6% of the parameters that observable factor models estimate, our depiction of conditional expected returns are far more accurate. Once again, in this matched subsample, the conditional expectations that we're estimating explain about 2% of the variation in realized returns. If I use the Fama French Carhartt model, I explain less than a third of a percent on the basis of those conditional expectations. And we take this as suggestive as evidence of an idea that we are better capturing the risk exposures that the panel of stocks face. Now, if that's true, what we've also done is better estimated systematic risks. One way to test for that or measure that would be to ask, how close is the aggregate risk space we estimate to the mean variance efficient frontier? One way to measure that is to ask, what's the sharp ratio of the tangency portfolio associated with the systematic risks we are estimating? The out of sample sharp ratio on say our four factors is 2.6. <clears throat> that compares to the Fama French five factor model plus momentum, achieving an out of sample sharp ratio of 1.4. We take this as strong suggestive evidence 
that we are better estimating the aggregate risks in the economy because the factor space that we estimate appears more well, closer to the mean variance efficient frontier as measured by the tangency portfolio sharp ratio. Finally, this model gives us a means of understanding many characteristics all at the same time. There is a famous, well, well-known, at least to me, statement that John Cochran gave in his presidential address about a factor zoo, a zoo of factors. And when he's talking about the factor zoo, he's talking about these different ways to slice and dice assets based on observable characteristics that give you all these differences in average returns. And he asks, do we need the entire zoo? And we don't think you need every monkey in the zoo. Only eight of the characteristics, of the 36 characteristics that we look at, are significant at the 5% level. They are return-based characteristics, they are market beta, and they are size, either measured by market cap or book assets. And if we restrict the model to only use these eight pieces of information about every stock, we find very little degradation of the model performance in terms of those two R squareds I talked about, in terms of what it's telling me about aggregate risk, that riskiness of stocks, and what it's telling me about individual stocks' risk exposures. And so on this basis, we would say the most characteristics are irrelevant when you're able to properly evaluate that statement jointly. In the paper, I'll just flag a number of extensions that we have, some robustness checks we also have. Um, I'll highlight that we uh, analyze whether or not this is all in small stocks versus large stocks because we have this large panel of stock returns. It appears that the uh, predictability and the explanation of the riskiness is very similar across those two. Um, maybe more pertinent to this conference is a, an idea that when we look at annual returns, some more characteristics do kind of pop up as significant. So there is some scope for using this model for longer term uh, returns and thinking about longer term asset management. Um, I will note, perhaps as a digression, that a nice feature of this model, because I'm selling it right now, is that you can estimate this gamma matrix, this mapping between observable characteristics and risk exposure on stocks over here and then bring another stock in that has some characteristics associated. You can just apply that gamma over here and get a cost of capital for that new firm without a long time series of returns for that new firm. So that in the paper allows for some interesting, I think, cross-validation exercises where we estimate gamma on the large stocks, use it for the small, estimate gamma on the small, that kind of thing. But let me conclude. What we've done is we've come up with a new latent factor estimator called instrumented principal components. It handles dynamic asset pricing models very easily. I did not talk about how you compute it. You iterate on regressions. It converges within seconds. It's very quick. The empirical model performance is outstanding vis-a-vis -vis the well-known alternatives using the Fama French Carhartt model, principal components. I didn't even talk really about principal components because its depiction of risk compensation, expected returns, is so abysmal. Um, the empirical facts that we find on this large panel of stock data, about 1.4 million stock month observations, is that once you allow for a multi-dimensional aggregate risk space, it appears as though there are no anomalies in the cross-section of stocks. Yes, characteristics are telling us important information. The information they're telling us is about risk exposure, how that varies across stocks, how it varies across time. 